So we are in week two of our series on mental health, and uh, we're discussing the topic of anxiety today. And um, <clears throat> what I want to do today is I want to try and accomplish three goals as we talk about anxiety. The first one is um, if, if you have anxiety, I want to validate the fact that you have anxiety. I, I, want to, I want to say that I believe you when you say that you have anxiety and it's something that you deal with. Um, I want it to be informative for people who do not have anxiety uh, because most certainly you know someone who does. Uh, and so I want to be informative to you on how to deal with those people and how to work with them and love them and care for them. Uh, and then I want to provide some practical and biblical tools uh, for dealing with anxiety in your life. Now, I want, to, I want to be transparent with you about anxiety. I do not have anxiety and I don't know a lot about it. Um, the, the closest that I ever come to anxiety is uh, when I know I have to put a suit on. You know what I mean? Like I have that feeling like I want to, I want to just, I'd rather just quit my job and not do anything. Uh, and another time where I get really close to anxiety is if I see someone's phone and you can see like their email number and there's like 4,000 emails on there. But that's not, like that makes me anxious. But being anxious is not the same as having anxiety. You understand what I'm saying? So there's a difference there um, in, in what uh, those things do and how they manifest. Uh, I want to say uh, anxiety is normal. Anxiety is a real thing. Uh, you are normal. You are not broken if you have anxiety. There is nothing wrong with you. You are not less valued uh, because you have anxiety. And I want you to understand... That anxiety does not disqualify you from God's love or God's working in your life. Please, if you're suffering and struggling with anxiety, read that, commit it to memory, know that, that anxiety does not disqualify you from God's love or God's work in your life. Now, to be, to be completely clear about this, everything that I'm going to say to you today about anxiety, I've learned in the past month of my life. Um, I, I, I told you it's not something I struggle with. And so all of these things that I've learned, um, I, I just want to present them to you. And by the way, I had um, actual professionals read this to make sure I wasn't ruining anything today because uh, I was super nervous about whether or not that would happen. But here's some things that I've learned about anxiety. Uh, anxiety is the body's natural response to the perception of danger. Right? It's the body's natural response to the perception of danger. So if you perceive that there's some danger, um, whether it's real right in front of you or if it's just something in your mind, your body's natural response is anxiety. Uh, feelings of anxiety come from seemingly nowhere or nowhere and always feel brand new every time. Now, if, you, if you're struggling with anxiety or if you have anxiety in your life, you understand that uh, it's not like a... It might be a recurring thing, but it doesn't feel like a recurring thing to you. It feels like a brand new thing every time. Uh, anxiety overestimates the probability uh, that a bad thing will happen. Uh, it overestimates the cost or the result should the thing that you are anxious about actually happen. Um, I say this in love. This is something that I've learned. Please don't get offended by this. Anxiety is irrational and born from things or situations that are not necessarily real, typically, okay? So this isn't like a sweeping everybody thing, uh, but it's born from situations that are not necessarily real. However, that does not change the reality for the person who is dealing with anxiety. So it might be a total uh, myth, it might be a total misperception of a situation, but it doesn't change how real it feels to the person struggling with anxiety. Anxiety forces the, this person, forces people to make up a story to tell themselves, uh, but for them, whether it's real or perceived, it is as real as me standing here in front of you. Anxiety uh, is not a fleeting thought. Okay, if you have a fleeting thought about a thing, that's not anxiety. Anxiety is persistent. It's a mental attack with physical manifestations. Now, there is a huge 
difference between situational anxiety and recurring anxiety. Let me give you an example. So situational anxiety would be uh, uh, the, the feelings that you have before you take a test or the feelings that you have before you go in for like a job performance review. Uh, and then when that happens, it goes away. Uh, the recurring, the, the pounding anxiety that people feel um, overestimate the cost of those situations. So for example, if you, uh, if you have anxiety, you might be going for a test or a job performance review and, and be thinking in your head and, and getting all worked up over the idea like, if I go into this performance review and it doesn't go well, my, my house is gonna burn down, I'm gonna lose my family. And, and some, for some of you, if you're not struggling with anxiety, that sounds completely ridiculous. But if you struggle with anxiety, those feelings are as real as they can possibly be. So there's just a couple things that I learned about anxiety. Um, I, I found the 10 most common physical symptoms of anxiety. I, well, here's what I want to do, but I'm not going to do. I want to know in the room who is. Because I want to ask, is, do you get this? But I'm not going to do that. Okay? So just... Relax, I'm not going to do that. All right, I want to do it, I'm not going to do it. Ten, top ten symptoms of anxiety uh, that I found. First is headaches. If you, if you suffer with anxiety, you know that headaches are a part of it. Um, dizziness is another thing that people deal with. Uh, jelly legs. Um, jelly legs. The, I feel like I can't stand up. I feel like I can't be still. Um, the advice for jelly legs is don't sit down. If, you, if you're dealing with anxiety and you, and you have this jelly legs thing, keep walking through whatever is going on. Don't sit down because it doesn't give uh, your body an opportunity to recover from that, okay? Uh, another one is heart palpitations. Um, what happens is that these things become more noticeable during uh, an anxiety issue or an anxiety event. Uh, the, another one is sweating. Uh, sweating happens because it's the beginning of the fight or flight reflex. We're going to talk about that in just a second. And sweating is actually good because it expels toxins from your body. Uh, tension and muscle aches uh, is another part of it. Shortness of breath or over breathing. And if you think of like a, uh, a fish out of water, just <gasps> like, I, I, like you feel as though you cannot catch your breath and so you either have shortness of breath or you're over breathing to where you've kind of worked yourself up into something. Uh, digestive problems are another issue. Um, we're going to talk about how diet affects anxiety in just a minute but, but uh, people who suffer with anxiety tend to have IBS which is irritable bowel syndrome and irritable bowel syndrome is nothing more than anxiety for your guts. It's physically manifested through what your body does. Uh, the next one is tachycardia. Uh, tachycardia is described as more than 100 beats per minute in your heart. Uh, I've actually had that happen to me before, and I was taken out of Target on a stretcher, so that was exciting. Um, and then the last, uh, the last one, and the most common one, uh, is fatigue and exhaustion. Now, this fatigue and exhaustion, as I've learned, uh, comes as an all-day thing, and it happens especially after an anxiety attack. And it's a vicious cycle because it wears you out mentally and physically, but then doesn't allow you to sleep so that you can recover. Right? This I want to just say, everything that I've learned about anxiety, it is a hellscape. It is a hellish existence if these are the symptoms that someone has to go through. And I, I, I would be very, very, very upset with someone who was dismissive of someone who had anxiety just because they never had it. I'll give you a, just a quick thought here. Okay, before I moved to Syracuse, I thought seasonal affect depression was a joke. <laughs> and before I moved to Syracuse, if somebody said, oh, I get depressed in the winter, I would have said stupid things like, get over it, buck up, that's not real. And then I found myself weeping in my garage, thinking about getting in my truck and leaving my family and everything because I just can't do it anymore. And so when you think about anxiety, just because you don't suffer with it, please understand that it is a real thing that real people actually do struggle with. And it sounds like hell to me. <clears throat> One thing that people do when they feel anxious uh, is go to something that makes them feel good. Uh, we go to, to, to a thing, to some kind of activity, 
uh, that makes us feel good. And it releases a chemical in our body called serotonin. Now, the serotonin is known as the happy chemical. Uh, and there are four basic chemicals that your brain releases into your body. Uh, serotonin is one, oxytocin, dopamine, and endorphins. They all release happy chemicals into your body. And some people have called it the quartet of happiness because these things flood your body and mind with feelings of goodness. Now, so many people, uh, when they're feeling anxiety and depression, they wanna to go to something that makes them feel good. One of the things that people typically go to is junk food or terrible food. Um, you, everybody's seen like the rom-com where they break up and then somebody's eating a gallon of ice cream, you know what I mean? Like people go to that sort of thing to make them feel better because it releases that serotonin in their body and they feel good for a little while. Now, here's the connection between your brain and your digestive health. Because if you feel a certain way and you go to a junk food thing to make you feel better, your body is not excited, lit, like really, about the junk that you put in. Let's just be honest. Right? Nobody's going to vegetables to feel happy. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's like, oh, a carrot's gonna really solve everything today. It's just not, it doesn't work like that, right? And so we go to this junk food and what ends up happening is we feel bad, we want something to make us feel good, so we go to this junk food thing, we eat it, and then we feel lethargic and gross, and so because we feel bad again, we go back to the bad thing and do that again. So this is the cycle that happens, and this is how your brain affects your gut, and your gut affects your brain, what you eat has an effect on your anxiety. Many studies, new studies have come out showing that a vitamin B, B as in boy, vitamin B deficiency could be a major cause of anxiety. And I think one of the reasons is because we go to these terrible things to make us feel better. Now, anxiety, is this, are you guys good? Everybody following? All right, it's not as good as Rob's last week, but you know, whatever, we'll, we'll get there eventually. Anxiety triggers in people what's known as the fight or flight reflex. Have you, how many of you guys have heard of the fight or flight reflex? Fight or flight occurs in situations that provoke anxiety. Fight or flight is activated when there is imminent physical danger or a perceived psychological threat. Here's what happens. Uh, in, a, in, the, in an actual physical danger or a perceived physical danger, your eyes widen, you begin to tremble, your skin flushes, your heartbeat elevates. And here's what's going on there. When you have a situation in front of you, whether it's real or perceived, your adrenal glands, your adrenaline glands begin to release uh, whatever adrenaline into your body and what starts to happen is that your, your mind is preparing your body to either fight or to run away. Now, if you're gonna fight, how many have been in like fisticuffs, right? Did anybody ever get into a fight like this? <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know, whatever. No, when you get into a fight, it's a tense moment. Your, your eyes widen, your breathing gets heavy, your heart elevates, and blood is pumped everywhere into your body so that you can fight. This is what you need if you're gonna throw knuckles at somebody. You have to have that going on. And so that's the fight part of the reflex. And because your adrenal glands have released adrenaline into your body, it takes 20 to 60 minutes for your body to uh, get back to homeostasis. I learned a new word. <laughs> that means normal for all of you non-medical people. <laughs> but it takes 20 to 60 minutes because you've been, you've been pumped, you're ready for a fight, you're ready to do that. Now, your eyes widen so that you can be alert, your heart pumps blood because it's time for a fight. If you're going to choose the flight aspect of it, your body does the exact same thing. Your eyes widen, blood gets pumped around your body, your breathing gets up, your heart rate gets up because that's what you need to run as well. You need it to fight and you need it if you're gonna run. And so anxiety is triggered when that either real or perceived danger is there so that you can fight that thing or so that you can run from that thing. Now, for the person who is dealing with anxiety, that danger that is out there is as real as if there was a bear 
10 feet away from you. There is no distinction between real and perceived when someone is faced with that anxiety. Everything that I have read, every professional that I've talked to, points to one fact when anxiety is overcoming you. You must fight your anxiety. You must choose to fight. And the thing that I say about that is fighting is a choice. It's a choice that only you can make, and it's a choice that you must make. It is a necessary choice. And so I want to give you four quick things. Choosing to fight anxiety means uh, four things. First is this. It means confronting the fear. You have to confront the fear. Whatever the thing is that's out in front of you, be it an actual bear, right? You everybody seen that, uh, that one movie when Leonardo DiCaprio got his pretty face messed up? And Yeah. Okay. A bear could just take you out, no problem, right? But you have to confront that. You got, if you run from a bear, by the way, none of you are fast enough to do that. None of you can climb a tree higher than a bear can get you. So you have to confront it. So whatever the thing is in your life, you have to confront that fear. Avoiding it fuels the anxiety. If a, if a situation happens and you want to avoid that thing, it's as if you're throwing gasoline on a fire and it flares up. It fuels your anxiety. So you have to confront the fear to deal with it. Now, if you are facing that thing, if you choose to confront that thing, if you're going to face that attack, it, it means that you're growing. It means that you're on the right track. If you're going to face your fear, if you're going to face something difficult, it means that you're on the right track. The person who is suffering from anxiety needs to get to the root of their negative emotions. And so here's my plug for professional counseling. I am a huge fan, huge proponent of professional counseling. Here's the mistake that people make with professional counseling. It's the same mistake that they make when they take antibiotics, by the way. When you take antibiotics and the doctor says, take these pills for 10 days, and you start to feel better after three days and stop taking the pills, then all of that hasn't been flushed out of your system. And so guess what happens? <laughs> Typically, it comes back meaner and stronger. So if you go into professional counseling, you might go for two or three weeks or a month and you go, I feel great. Everything's wonderful. You have not been going to professional counseling long enough because those things will come. And I'm not, listen, I'm, I don't get paid from anybody. I don't have any professional counseling sponsorships. This is, a, this is not a professional, like I don't have like their uniform on or anything today. I have spent thousands of my own dollars going into professional counseling to deal with that because um, I think everybody needs to do that. And so when you do that, it helps you get to the root of why you're having this anxiety. Second, choosing to fight uh, means this. It means recognizing that anxiety has a limit. Anxiety has a limit. Anxiety has a ceiling, even if you remain in that situation. Okay, it's, you remember the old cartoons, uh, like Tom and Jerry? I, I know I'm really old, but maybe some of you understand Tom and Jerry. When like the thermometer would go into something hot and it would go all the way up and it would burst the top of the thermometer, right? Anxiety has a ceiling. There's gonna come a, a point and there's gonna come a time when it's not gonna get any worse than it is. Okay, so we have to understand that. And so what I need you to do when you're having that situation is do some mental gymnastics and just backflip off of that. I wish, man, I wish I could do a backflip. I wish I could do a backflip. If I did, I'd have to go to some professional doctors to get that taken care of. But it means taking a step back mentally and telling yourself that it will end. When that anxiety is happening, you have to step back and say, this is going to end. It's going to end at some point. It's going to end. And just count on that and know that it has a limit. Choosing to fight means telling a friend that you're struggling. Now, if you have anxiety, this is a trigger for you. Just hearing that I have to tell somebody about my anxiety can be a trigger for people struggling with anxiety. But nothing, there's nothing that's more immediate in the healing process of anxiety than to get out of your own head and say your thing to someone else. If you've ever done that, you know how freeing that can be. Because when anxiety is wrapped around you, you're like a bird in a cage, but when you open your mouth, you no longer have that, con that construct holding you down. So choosing to fight your anxiety means telling a friend that you're struggling. 
Lastly is this, choosing to fight means uh, changing your what ifs, changing your what ifs. So a lot of, and I'll just give gen a general example here. You know, people uh, are get anxious to fly and they have anxiety attacks when it comes to flying and, and or crossing bridges. That's another time that people uh, have to deal with it. And so, uh, well, what if the plane crashes? Or what if the bridge collapses? Can I just say this, like just being real? You, you're not a pilot, like it's, if it's gonna crash, it's gonna <coughs> crash. The plane's going down, it's going down. What are you gonna do? Go tell the captain to get out of his seat and then sit there, right? So change your what ifs. What if we land safely and then we get to go sit on the beach with pina coladas? <laughs> everybody, wants to, everybody wants a pina colada right now. You know what I'm saying? And so it's changing your what ifs. This is, the, this is part of the mental gymnastics that you do. What if we actually cross that bridge and make it to Target and get the stuff that we need? Then we can feed our family. And then see, it's rabbit trails, right? So you can go down one rabbit trail with your anxious thoughts, or you can go down another rabbit trail with your positive thoughts and change that and do your mental gymnastics. Now, I'm gonna go through some Bible verses today in church. I know that's shocking for you, but it's what we do here. I'm not gonna have you turn. I'm not gonna have it on the screen. What I just want you to do is hear God's words as they're spoken to you today, okay? Yeah, got it. Anybody need to do any actual calisthenics right now? Bored to death, Shannon? Am I boring everybody? All right. You have to say that. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. <clears throat> but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, I want to say that there is nothing about this that is a magic pill. It's not a magic pill that you take at once. It's a changing of routine. It's making a choice to do the gymnastics and come away from those thoughts. You choose to rejoice. You choose to be gentle to yourself. And a lot of times people read this passage, let your gentleness be evident to all, and they think that it's me to you, gentleness, but I think that it has a lot to do with me to me, and you to you. Be gentle to yourself. I posted a picture this week of Dr. Phil, and it said that um, when we speak, the average is 150 words per minute, but as we think, it's something like 1,500 words per minute minimum that we think. And so we need to be gentle to ourselves. Let me ask you, how gentle have you been to yourself with the words inside of your head this week? The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. The reason that we can not be anxious about anything is because the Lord is near. We have to flip the script rather than giving in to our anxiety, we have to choose to pray and choose to present everything to God. Do you think that God does not know about anxiety? He does. He knows about anxiety. He knows about your anxiety. And you think about the story of Jesus the night before he was crucified. He goes off and he's praying alone. And the Bible says that he's praying so hard and he's so anxious that he sweats drops of blood. And he's begging God for another way. He's begging God for another way. If, any, if we can do anything, God, besides this cross, please, let's do something else. And he's sweating drops of blood. And listen, no other way came. No other way came. And so what Jesus had to do was face the thing that was out in front of him. He had to go and face the cross. He had to choose to fight. I believe Jesus' fight or flight reflex was enacted the night before he went to the cross. 
Jesus chose to go to the cross. He chose to fight. And when no other way came, he faced his anxiety, he faced his fear. Why? Because the Lord is near. Now, please understand that I am not saying pray away your anxiety. I'm not saying that you should pray away your anxiety. The reason why is because that's stupid. And it doesn't work. See, what happens if you say, I'm going to pray away my anxiety, and then God doesn't take away your anxiety, then you go, well, God must not be real because he didn't take away my anxiety. And it feels as though the Lord is not near when actually the Lord is near. The Lord is with you, with you in your anxiety. Jesus' name is Emmanuel, which means God, anybody? With us. With us. And listen, there's no pre-qualifiers to that. It's not God with you when everything's going great. It's God with you, and it's a blanket over your life. God is with you. So here's how I see it. I think you pray about your anxiety, but then you face your anxiety because the Lord is near. Jesus prayed, and his anxiety didn't go away. He had to confront it. The Lord is near, so you can face your anxiety. You can deal with it. You can make it to the other side. One of the most impressive lies that the devil has is that there's not another side to your pain. And Jesus is the king of getting us to the other side. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says these words. He says, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, the richest dude in history, in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. <clears throat> but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You know what he's saying right there? Can I translate that for you? Get out of your own head. This is fighting anxiety. Get out of your own head. All these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The reason that we can believe this, the reason that Jesus tells us that we can believe this, that we don't have to worry, is because he is the impetus and the foundation for that promise. He is the one who is there. He is the one that is reliable. Hey, listen, anxiety and worry are blood brothers, right? They're related, okay? And so Jesus is saying, don't worry. Just give all of that to me. In 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Fishing is a fun thing to do. <clears throat> and what do you do when you're fishing, right? You, if, you're, if, you're fi if you're using like a plastic bait, you throw that thing out and you, you bring it back, right? You throw it out and you bring it back. And this is the funny thing about anxiety. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And if we're thinking about casting and fishing, then we have every bit of control to bring that back to ourselves or to leave it out there. I, I, was in, I went to college. I know that's surprising for many of you. And uh, it was a small, poor college down in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And one day we were playing softball <coughs> in one of the fields. And our college is right next to the Pasquatank River. Um, it, it would smell bad, so we called it the Pasquatank River. Um, and one day we're out there playing softball. And as guys do, they get bickery at each other. You know, like, hey, you, you touch the base and you're blah, blah, you know, that whole thing. And I had like this hippie friend, like hippie surfer friend, his name is Jeremy. And he was playing in right field because he was terrible. Like that's where you put, by the way, if you've ever played in right field, that's because you're the worst player on the team. So <laughs> if you didn't know that, um, that's why you're out there. And so he's out in right field and he's not, he's not interested in these arguments that are going on among the people. Right? He, he hates it, and, I, and I'm starting to feel it too. And he's like, guys, come on, we have to stop this. We have to stop. Just play ball. Let's just do this. And uh, everybody just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. 
and like the next play happens, and the ball happens to go out into right field. And so this is what my friend Jeremy does. He grabs the ball, and he turns around, and just throws it in the river. <laughs> and because we were a poor college, the game was over. That was it. This is what you need to do with your anxiety. This is what I think that verse is talking about when you cast all your anxiety on him. Not fishing, where you just constantly bring it back to yourself, but you take that ball and you throw that and you get rid of it. There's a million ways to do that. There's a million ways to do that. And just as different as you are from the person sitting next to you, your prescription for this is as different as theirs is. But it starts with knowing that Jesus is reliable. It starts with knowing that you can cast all of your anxiety on him. And I think it continues on with professional counseling, more fighting, more fighting, more fighting, more fighting. This is a battle that you can win. Anxiety does not have to be your story. It is a battle that you can win. Brene Brown, uh, an author, said this. She said, we're all afraid. We just have to get to the point where we understand that we can also be brave. Sometimes the bravest thing that you can do is cast your anxiety to Jesus. And in those moments where you're feeling that, you say, Jesus, I'm giving this to you. I don't know, you do whatever you're going to do with it. I'm giving this to you. And you keep doing that. You keep doing that. You keep seeking professional help. You keep fighting, fighting, and fighting. And this does not have to be your story. So let's rely on the name of Jesus. Let's stand and let's close with this song. There is power.